not sure if they're, I'm looking at my list and it looks like there's most of the people who are registered are here. Um, oh, okay. Still not showing anyone on my Yeah, phone. I just, I just um, released the list. Oh, I have to go. click okay. on something for that to happen. Oh, there you go. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to, this is Michelle Mariano from the Society for the Arts and Healthcare, um, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Society and our presenters and the consulting service for attending um, today's webinar on music and medicine, enhancing the healing environment. Um, we have a wonderful presentation prepared by Kathy DeWitt and Ronna Kaplan, uh, who will introduce themselves. Um, and uh, we'd like to acknowledge the National Endowment uh, of the Arts for its support of the consulting service at this time. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to notify everybody that we will be recording this session, So, uh, and I try to post the YouTube of the presentation in the archive that you can access later. Also, you will have, uh, you'll see in the webinar, presentation archive on our website that um, the slideshow in PDF format will be available to you after the presentation. It's actually up now if you'd like to open that up for reference. Um, the way this webinar works is that we're going to go for about an hour, um, 20 minutes for each presenter approximately, and then we'll have uh, 20 minutes reserved uh, at the end for question and answer uh, session. And Several of you submitted questions in advance, and we'll begin with those, and then we'll open the floor to um, live questions uh, based on the, pre uh, the presenter's remarks. Um, and with that, oh, uh, please place your phones on mute. I'm actually also going to put uh, the presenters and myself on lecture mode, so in case you have problems accessing your mute function, um, we won't be... Uh, we won't hear the noise in, on your end. Uh, when we go into the question and answer period, um, I will take I will take us all off lecture mode. Okay, Michelle, I have one question yeah. um, right now. Was did you did you put the list that we'd answered a question about the list of the top five ways to use music? I did. That up already? Well, it, oh no, it's not up. I no. Okay. Um, we'll just address that. I just didn't know whether. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that that question is still on there, and we can uh, provide you know a document with the with that list uh, as a supplemental material later on. Thanks. Okay, great. Does anybody uh, else have any questions before we get started? Okay, great. So now I'm going to place you on lecture mode. The conference is in lecture mode. And at this. Point. I will. Oh, which one of you is beginning? I thought Rana, right? Right. Okay. I'm going to turn over the controls to you, and um, let's see if I can find you. Here you are. Okay. <laughs> Near the bottom. Yeah. All right. And okay. you should be getting the controls at any any second now. Okay. There you are. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Can you all hear me? All right. They can't. You can't, can't hear them. Oh, that's right. <laughs> but I can hear you, and I think Kathy can hear you. Okay, so you are here for Music and Medicine, Enhancing the Healing Environment. And uh, so I'd like to first introduce myself, and then maybe, uh, Kathy, you could quickly introduce yourself as well, and then we'll continue. So I am the Director of Music Therapy at the Music Settlement, which is a community music school in Cleveland, Ohio. And we have a large music therapy program. We have 14 music therapists that work for us, and we see people at our campus here uh, for music therapy, and then we send all of our music therapists to various medical, social service, or educational settings throughout the uh, Northeast Ohio area. And I am one of the consultants for the SA, um, expert consultants, and uh, we do a lot of work in hospitals and um, hospices and so this is a good topic for me. So, Kathy, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Kathy DeWitt, the Musician in Residence and Music Program Director for Shands Arts and Medicine in Gainesville, Florida. And I've been there about 16 years. And um, we have about anywhere from 10 to 15 paid artists in residence in our program and right now we have in addition several interns. We've got about five interns and we have a lot of volunteers, about 50 per semester and um, 
we just had added a new facility to the new cancer center, so now we're kind of spread out quite a bit. But I've been a SAW consultant for about um, six years in the music and healing field, and glad to be here. Actually, um, I'm Okay, sorry. so I'm going to Rana, start Rana? advancing the slides. If you're wondering, uh, we control that. Rana, um, actually... I'm actually getting some feedback on your line from the speaker. Okay, I'll take it off speaker then. Sorry, thank you. All right, that's all right. Hello? Still there? I don't I don't know what happened to Rhonda. Uh oh. <laughs> I think she might have accidentally <laughs> I think she might have accidentally. Um, accidentally hung up? Uh, hung up when she removed her phone from her speaker. Um, hmm. Well, our first slide is one that we both um, put together. Our goal is that you who are participating will become familiar with model programs in music and health care. And I'm back. So oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I must have pushed the wrong button. Okay. So good, finish your sentence, though, Kathy. I'm sorry. Oh, we're just we're just reading the learner objectives to the group. Okay, great. <laughs> Learning, hoping we'll learn ways to develop music and healthcare programs in their own settings. And then finally, number three, to gain an understanding of how the field has grown, to include collaborative work among therapists, performing artists, and musicians. So um, the way we've divided this up is that I'm going to talk about music therapy, and then we will segue. Um, into talking about the musicians in healthcare, and uh, along the way, you'll hear about the similarities and differences among them. So, here is the definition for music therapy from the American Music Therapy Association it's the clinical and evidence based use of music interventions to accomplish individualized goals within a therapeutic relationship by a credentialed professional who has completed an approved music therapy program. I know that's a very long sentence. Um, and uh, there's several key points that I want to point out. There's the clinical and evidence base uh, is the first part that, um, so we have research to back up the use of music interventions. We have uh, experts in the field who give testimony to the use and um, experience. And then there are always individualized goals for each patient or each client. And uh, the therapeutic relationship is stressed here because it's not, it's way more than someone coming in and turning on a CD or the radio. And uh, all professionals in music therapy have credentials. We have a certification board, and all of the music therapists must go through an approved music therapy degree program. So Kathy and I thought it would be interesting if we would each talk a little bit how, about how we came to these professions, as it were. And so I know that our paths are very different, so I just wanted to briefly share mine. I actually knew when I was a senior in high school that I was going to go into the field of music therapy, and that isn't always the path that happens. And, but I was lucky that my band director told me about it when I was a senior in high school, and I went home and I told my mother, and she said, oh, well, they have music therapy at the music settlement because I took flute and piano and theory here as a child and a teenager, and she used to sit outside the room and read the catalog. <laughs> so the good thing was that then I was able to come here and actually observe the person who became my boss and one of my mentors, and I actually, she was only the first director, she was the first director of the program, and I'm the second. She was here for 37 years. And so um, I was able to observe it before I went into the, the program, and I wanted to combine my love and talent in music with my passion about working with other people and helping them. So I knew I wanted to do something in social service or special ed or something like that. And so I was able to choose among the top music therapy programs. Even back then, there were several to choose from, and I went to Michigan State University, which was the first music therapy program actually in the world. And um, it, it, I actually had a double degree in music therapy and music ed. And if you want more information about what is required for such a 
degree, then you can go to the website, which we'll provide uh, later on of the American Music Therapy Association. And as Kathy mentioned to some people, I happen to be the president of that association as well in my spare time. So that's just a tiny bit of background as to how I came into the field. And I've worked as a music therapist for over 35 years, and I've worked here at the Music Settlement since 1988, first as a clinician and then in the last six years as a manager of the department. So now I'm going to go back to continuing with the slides. So some more information about music therapy. Uh, you see here a music therapist, and she's working with a patient either in a burn unit or a surgical um, ICU. And it is a specialized use of music in service of individuals with needs in mental health, physical health, habilitation, rehabilitation, or special education. And our purpose is to help individuals attain and maintain their maximum levels of functioning. The treatment is prescriptive, and it can be implemented individually or in group settings. And assessment, treatment planning, and documentation are all required. This group here actually is a group at our community facility, the community music school here. It's some young adult men, and they have been in this group for a long time, and it continues to be very important in their lives. It's a very important way for them to socialize in a, an appropriate setting. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. There we go. Next, uh, one might ask, why music therapy? And this is a quote from a doctor named Lester Glick. Music and the other arts are unifying forces among men. They help to give a sense of identification with the rest of the community across national, cultural, ethnic, and other dividing lines. Music is often considered as a universal language. If you want to know what I look like, there I am. <laughs> and uh, this is um, a young man who has many disabilities but loves music. And one of the things about music is that you don't necessarily find that a person with a disability in one area uh, would be necessarily disabled in his or her musical skills. This guy couldn't talk that much, but he could sing and uh, match the same, sing in the same key in which I sang, and we worked a lot on his physical motor coordination through music as well as some of his social and communication skills. So as I said, music is a universal language. It occurs naturally in our environment in many, in many settings. You might hear music at the ball game or in religious services or on, you know, over the loudspeaker in, in the elevator or the grocery store, et cetera. And it may or may not be music that you particularly enjoy, but it's there. And it is a socially appropriate activity and leisure skill, and it can prov provide predictable time-ordered and reality-ordered structure. Well, what does that mean? Time-ordered, you can think of uh, with the fact that music lasts a certain length of time. You know, every song or every piece has a duration. And <clears throat> for that length of time, the music might be able to help someone get him, him or herself together. Uh, for example, if um, if there's a piece that's five minutes long and someone is playing his or her part for that five minutes, then he's cooperating with the group for that length of time. He is, um, you know, playing his part. He might be reading music. He might be playing from memory. He might be improvising. But it's all over the length of time. In terms of reality-ordered structure, uh, very often we see patients who have dementia or um, Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia, and we find that when they're participating in a music experience, they might be in the same shared reality with the other participants. For example, if they sing harmony to Amazing Grace when the rest of the group is singing Amazing Grace, then they're in the same reality. And again, that reality can last for a certain length of time. Even if they can't tell you what they ate for breakfast, they might be able to participate in the music because research has shown that parts of the brain that process music are often the last ones to go. And then, as you all know, or you probably wouldn't be on this call, music is enjoyed by most people. <clears throat> 
Also, music therapy provides opportunities for experiences in self-organization and self-expression. I mentioned self-organization in terms of the structure. A lot of times the rhythm can be organizing. The form can be organizing with the fact of, let's say, you have a song and you know it has many verses and it has a chorus. So you know what to expect each time. A lot of times younger music therapy patients or clients might have um, a hello or a goodbye song in their sessions, and that helps them with predictability and expectations, knowing what's going to come, come next. For self-expression, I think, again, that's pretty obvious to us as musicians that there are many opportunities for self-expression. And often these um, opportunities can't be really matched through more typical verbal ways. There's opportunities for experiences in relating to others because music can be uh, delivered in a group or a one-to-one setting. But even if it's a one-to-one setting, in music therapy, the patient would be relating with the music therapist or might be relating with family members. Um, There's opportunities, as I said, uh, to participate at one's own level. So, uh, you know, you could be someone who can sight-read music and can play sonatas, or you could be someone that plays by ear, or you could be someone that um, needs assistance with an augmentative communication device, something like that. So there's many levels that can be met for experience, and I said for a group or individual, and it can reinforce non-music skills such as speech, language, and math, and I already said it can give people with disabilities who are not necessarily disabled in their musical skills a chance to excel, and perhaps they could be leaders. So there's many benefits. You can make connection and establish collaborations. Um, You can make connections between the patient and the therapist, between the patient and the music, between the patient and his or her peers, between the patient and, as I said, his his or her family or um, caregivers, and can work together with other therapists or other musicians as well, can really create some transformation. There can be some pretty dramatic changes from isolation to interaction, from aggression to more positive participation, things like that. In terms of building on foundations, um, a music therapist can build on the skills that a patient or client might have. For example, they might have strong musical skills or they might have strong verbal skills or or, um, many other types of skills, and we can then uh, build from those. This young lady in this picture only has four fingers on each hand, but she has perfect pitch, and so she's able to figure out, because she knows what sound she wants to play, she's able to figure out adaptive fingerings. And she actually can play many different instruments and sang before she talked. So music therapy is a great avenue for her. And it can help people reach their aspirations. So we try to help each person with whom we work uh, reach their greatest potential and achieve their individual goals. Then there are many goal areas that a music therapist might address. Behavioral psychosocial skills, communication and language, perceptual motor, cognitive or academic skills, physiological responses such as um, reducing stress, increasing, uh, reducing stress, reducing anxiety, increasing relaxation. And although we primarily focus on the non-musical goal areas, there are opportunities to address musical skills in this setting as well. And studies on the creative arts in healthcare have shown links to the following trends. So I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. For people with dementia, there's um, evidence that music uh, therapy reduces wandering or agitated states. It can reduce the incidence of depression in a number of different populations. It can increase staff retention and caregiver satisfaction. Both of these are very important can increase the quality of life, particularly for those diagnosed with terminal cancer or for older adults in general. It can be um, a complementary therapy for social functioning and participation in rehabilitation, and it can have a beneficial effect on mood with patients with Parkinson's, traumatic brain injuries, uh, those in palliative medicine units, et cetera. trying to advance here. An, um, another slide showing more trends, speech rehabilitation for patients recovering from strokes with the 
techniques such as melodic intonation therapy or modified melodic intonation therapy is very effective for helping people regain some of their speech. Gait training is useful for patients uh, who have Parkinson's disease. One of our therapists right now is doing a study with patients with multiple sclerosis, and they're showing improvement, as well as our patients who have had strokes. There's evidence for a reduced length of hospital stay, fewer medical visits, improved patient compliance during medical procedures, the reduced use of pain, anti-anxiety medications, and sedatives, and improved recovery time and reduced need for higher levels of acute care. I um, I also didn't mention when I was talking about my background that I'll, um, I have been a clinical music therapist for 35-ish years, as I said, but I've also done some research, and I myself, not only as a manager but as a clinician, have worked in research projects. One of them was in the neonatal and cancer care unit several years ago, and the pilot study that preceded ours, the babies who listened to music piped into their isolates, they were lullabies, um, went home an average of 12 days sooner than did the babies who only had the standard care. So that's just one of many examples. And it's a low-cost therapy, therapy with few side effects. In terms of my personal involvement in music therapy, um, that is a picture of my flute. I don't know if it's really mine, but <laughs> I have uh, performed in units in healthcare settings. For example, as a volunteer or as part of my music therapy, I have been a clinical music therapist and a researcher. And so my primary research that I've done in a healthcare setting has been in the, the NICU. But then I, as a program manager, have supervised other medical music therapists, either in the palliative medicine unit, um, hospices. Let's see, um, we're starting in the cardiac unit now. Um, neurological units, we have several patients within those and several hours. And um, our other, our assistant administrator of the department is the supervisor of someone who works in a burn unit. So there's men, many uh, locations that we cover. And some of my responsibilities as a program manager in the healthcare setting are negotiating contracts with the various outreach agencies such as hospitals, nursing homes, um, extended care facilities, uh, adult day treatment programs, writing proposals and plans for new programs or for expansion of present programs, placing music therapists in those agencies, and providing information for grant applications. And um, usually it's the outreach partner who writes the grant application, and, and then I provide the information about the music therapy services and the budget that we would need and things like that. But because the grant is coming from their facility, I do not write the grant. And I've uh, been a workshop presenter and have been involved in publications, uh, either as supervising the therapist who's writing it or also uh, being a co-author. I just co-authored an article that will be coming out soon mm. about music therapy with teenage well, actually, this one, I'm sorry, music therapy with mothers with um, depression and other mental illnesses. So I have had to wear many hats in these positions. And then um, continuing on in that same vein, when we contract, when we contract through the community music school, there's many different things that happen with the music therapy. So we do the interviewing, the hiring, the staffing. We supervise the music therapists that we place in the various medical settings. We provide continuing education for the therapists. We do staff evaluation and performance reviews. We provide a lot of professional support, such as networking with the other therapists who work here, assist them with writing and presenting and researching, and uh, many of our therapists have leadership roles in our professional organizations. I'm not the only one. In terms of service management, we address lines of communication uh, with the other facility, and we help set up referral and assessment processes and any processes that are necessary for documentation and accountability, like um, how do we get their notes into the medical file. And, of course, we assist with program implementation, and it's always integrated with the whatever agency that the person is placed at, it's always integrated within their total milieu. 
and we provide some equipment and materials, and as I said, provide a supportive role in funding applications. We work on program evaluation and expansion, and the responsibilities for the partner agency include they have to have a liaison in place so that we have a contact person, they have to provide us space, and there has to be an ongoing coordination and communication. Uh, finally, I'm trying to move quickly here. Um, this is our segue here. So there's mu musicians working in healthcare in other ways. These can include arts at the bedside, performances in the lobbies or other open spaces, musicians helping choose music that's appropriate to the general spaces that might be piped into rooms or on radio stations um, or channels in, within the hospital, working with patients one-to-one -one or in groups, and caring for the caregiver activities. There are many other artists in healthcare, and they have various names. And this is not a conclusive list. This is um, examples. People might be called clinical musicians, music practitioners, music sanitologists, and they are people who work only with patients who are dying, music healers or sound healers, and harp therapists. And to sum um, up, a comparison between musicians and music therapists working in healthcare, you can see here on this slide that there are similarities as well as differences. So we're just going to quickly outline those. Similarities would be that all arts activities have some therapeutic aspects. Both the musicians and the music therapists believe in the power of music to heal, relieve suffering, elevate presence and awareness, and, pr and improve the quality of patients' lives. However, there are some differences. So for a performing artist or musician, um, their role is to foster participation in and appreciation of music by facilitating patients creating music or facilitating performances and or selecting and playing music. Music therapists do all of those things but also work with patients regarding personal meaning and musical expression and helping facilitate the awareness of meaning and what it has to teach them about themselves and how they might achieve optimal health and then maintain optimal health. We also consult with treatment teams, conduct individual and family evaluations and assessments, and provide individual and group therapy sessions. So, so um, sometimes I look at, at it as uh, different uh, places on a spectrum or a continuum. And then here you'll see a list of resources about music therapy, professional organizations, the certification board, the American Music Therapy Association, and then the SA again is listed. And these are two very general, good introductory music therapy books. So now I am going to try to turn over to Kathy. To make you the presenter. Okay, that should be working now. Thank you, Rana. It's very interesting. Our journeys were very different. Um, <laughs> I was aware of arts and medicine, and when I came into arts and medicine, they didn't really have a music program. They had a visual artists in residence. That was how they started. And I was already working out in the community um, playing music in a variety of different settings. I'm a jazz musician, and I have an all-women's bluegrass and folk band. I play at a church. So I thought arts and medicine was great, but I wasn't really particularly expecting to bring music into a hospital setting. But they finally kind of dragged me in, kicking and screaming. <laughs> and one of the first things that I did was to get a grant to procure a grand piano for the lobby. I think that's one of the most valuable things that we've done because when people come in and they they hear the music the piano music, and then they look over and they see that there's a real person playing. It's not mm -hmm. one of those player pianos, which to me is a little bit spooky to have in the hospital setting. <laughs> and then they'll come over and there's an interaction, or they just smile and they just stand for a few minutes. But there's a ripple effect. I've been um, up on a unit hours later, and I'll hear someone whistling or singing a, the same song that I know was played hours earlier down in the lobby. And... Um, over here, this is a harp, which was brought in by the group from the International Harp Therapy Association, one of the groups that Rana mentioned. And when I um, when I first came into the hospital, the International 
carp therapy group was looking for a place to do a practicum for one of their internships. They take their groups of aspiring harp therapists around to various settings, and one of the things they do is they do a week-long residency in a setting with a music program. So they wound up coming to Shands, and we wound up setting up things for them to do for the week that they were here, which included working with autistic children and playing in the lobby here and doing a concert and just a variety of settings. And then in re exchange for that, I got to go attend, and then I became uh, certified as a harp therapist as well, um, although it took me a while to do that since I was already here working in the hospital. So I came in, and we had the dry piano bar there, <laughs> and, and um, people would come up and make requests and sing along, and one of the first things that I did also was to start creating partnerships and bringing in other people in the community since I was already out in the community, that's kind of an easy way to start. If you're wanting to start a music program in your setting, um, a performance series is an easy way to start because there's people out there who are looking for a place to perform, and as long as you give them some clues about what kind of music they need to do and what the setting entails, you can bring in people from the community as performing guest artists. And this group was from Holland, the Robin Nolan Jazz Trio. They came with the Friends of Jazz, which I'm a member of, so this was a partnership we did with the Gainesville Friends of Jazz that was an outreach project for them. So I came into this environment kind of unexpectedly, and I learned that there were indeed therapeutic benefits of music, and these are sort of general ones that are a little bit more general, but along the same lines of the things that Rana talked about earlier. There were therapeutic benefits that were psychological, and there were also medical benefits that were physiological. And I see these benefits going room to room, often on the monitors. And we've gotten to the point, we got to the point rather quickly where we became considered as members of the team in that we get referrals now and people call and make referrals for patients for us to see. Um, or we'll just roam around and play in the halls and get called into rooms as well. But um, this is one of the rooms we played on regularly, dialysis, and that was a term that I was not familiar with. So coming into the hospital, I learned quite a few things that I hadn't known before. And in, um, in the dialysis unit, people are in there. This was the pediatric dialysis, so these children have been coming sometimes their whole lives because their kidneys aren't working right, and they have to come in here and get their blood cleansed and go through a machine that helps function in the way that their kidneys ordinarily would. And a lot of times they're waiting for a transplant. So we go, this is one of the examples of distraction. And this little girl on the pediatric intensive care unit, another place that I was not familiar with and learned a lot about. Um, and she was playing the guitar for her daddy, who was also in the room. And a lot of times when you go in a room, it's um, you wind up really doing the music as much for the family members sometimes as for the patient. Even if the patient is in the bed and isn't responding that much, it really changes the whole atmosphere of the room for the family. And they'll participate and start singing along. If you ask, well, what was the patient's favorite song? Or a song that means something to you all as a family. And then that kind of, I've had that create a, sort of a healing in families where there was a rift before. You know, Rana, how that is. Music can really right. cross these barriers in amazing ways. And this fellow was surrounded by people, but he really <laughs> he was looking for a chance, I think, to kind of get away <laughs> from everybody who was in his room, all his family members. So as soon as I walked in with this bowed psaltery, he just glommed on to that, and that was what he wanted to do, and he was just completely taken with that and kind of in this other world for a while. And It's a unique little instrument, which um, I've had a lot of success with in the hospital setting. It's easy to carry around, and it's easy to um, make a... a melody, play a melody on, it's a single string at a time, so it always is uh, intriguing to people and creates conversation. 
people ask, what is that? And the harp here that I have tuned pentatonically, which is a five-note scale, which is very harmonious so that it's instead of do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, it's do, re, mi, no, fa, so, la, la, back to do, so it's la, 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 la. It's a five-note scale, and the notes all sound really pretty together, so people can strum the harp and make a beautiful sound. And everyone always says, I always wanted to play a harp. And I say, well, here, go ahead. <laughs> and they go, oh, no, no, I couldn't. <laughs> but, you know, it just takes a little coaxing. This woman, was she had a strange disease that caused her a temporary paralysis completely out of the blue for a, a period of weeks. So this was um, very valuable for her to be able to reach out and stroke some strings and make a sound. It was a step in her healing process. And this little girl was at a hospital I was playing at in London, the Chelsea Westminster, which is a, a gorgeous hospital if you're ever over there and you get a chance to go. The day that I came, I had just missed a full-on opera that they had had there. But um, playing in the lobby this little girl was dancing and afterwards her uncle who was there with her came up and told me that she was about to have surgery and she was going to be in traction for three months so that was the last dancing she was going to get to do for some time so this is another example of a different kind of therapeutic benefit the emotional release of getting to have that before going into surgery one of my favorite things about music, which is what I do with it a lot in my whole life, is creating community. So when you go into a room and there's, even if there's just one person or two people or three people, you can immediately create a community with music. And like Rana was explaining about people being in the same reality, getting to be in the same reality by playing or singing or creating a music together, it's... um it's very community oriented and this is our little patient Anna and this is a volunteer and this is Anna's little brother Choo Choo <laughs> and they're all learning to play the psaltery at the same time so as was said before music is especially useful in situations where verbal communication is limited for example a population with autism primary progressive aphasia or Alzheimer's. And if it's a temporary condition, um, like coming out of a stroke, um, like Oliver Sacks, who's written, uh, you know, the latest book I think is Uranian Music, and he's also wrote Awakenings and is really well known for all his work with music and particularly um, memory disorders like Alzheimer's or dementia. And um, even though there are two different parts of the brain, music and language, music, especially in this therapeutic use, is used to reconnect the pathway. It can reconnect the neural pathway back over to language. So um, I worked with a lady who had been in a coma for a long time, and she just came out of it, but she couldn't really quite speak cohesively. She would say a sentence, but there would be a couple of words in the sentence that weren't really real words or didn't belong in the sentence. Or she would say, I'm fixing my husband a lizard for dinner or something like that. And I started asking her what her favorite music was, and she really liked Christmas music, and she really liked Elvis. So we started doing Jingle Bells and Elvis songs, and the speech therapist came in and said, well, let's try to get everyone to do music with this patient. And so even the housekeepers who came in to clean her room would sing, and she would sing along with everyone. And when she um, went into rehab, I followed her. I did follow up with her when she was in the rehab center, which was a different building that we don't ordinarily necessarily work in. But I saw her as she was about to go home, and she she hadn't been home in over a year, a year and a half. So she was excited and scared, and it all seemed... Uh, like um so that's an example of when you can when you can come back when the loss is only temporary a lot of times if it's a memory disorder 
like Alzheimer's or dementia or something that's in the later stages of life, then music can be used to to bring them back to a sense of who they are and to help remind them of who they are and what they've lost a lot of times is their identity. So it's, it's very valuable that people can start singing their favorite song even if they uh, can't speak in a complete sentence anymore. They can still sing all the words to their favorite song. It's quite amazing, really, to see. And it can also be a memory trigger that brings people back to places that this instrument reminded this lady of uh, of her homeland. For the reason that it is a memory trigger, it's also a reason why you do have to be careful how you use it. And I always ask people what they like or what they would like to hear or what kind of music. I don't. You don't just automatically walk into someone's room and start playing Amazing Grace, even even if it is the most requested song in the hospital. That doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is going to want to hear it. And a song that even started out as a positive memory for someone can change. If there was a song that was your favorite song that was played at your wedding, and then you go through an ugly divorce, that song is going to change for you. So music is very subjective, and that's why it's good to have this personal connection and contact, and the music therapist or the musician in residence can know a a little bit about the background or create a relationship so that... um, you don't automatically assume something is going to work for everyone. I also liked what you said about the structure of a song and creating a reality that has a structure to it because, for instance, we had a piano player who played um, He played music without a beginning or an end. He just played a constant series of arpeggios. Mm-hmm. You know, And if you heard it for about 30 seconds, it would sound nice. It would sound like Debussy. But if you were standing there for three minutes or you were working at the uh, kiosk where the concession workers are or the desk where people answer the phone, it would drive people crazy. <laughs> Everyone needs a beginning, a middle, and a Right, end. right. <laughs> this little girl was the princess of the PICU. She was just lovely. We had a lot of fun with her. The first day we went in, we said, would you like to play a song? Would you like to do a song with us? And she said, sure. And she jumped off her bed and ran over to the desk and turned on her CD player and started singing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. So she was actually leading the interaction, (laughs) which was kind of fun. And you never know, really, who's going to turn out to, to do that. This was one of our visiting guests who played in the Infusion Center. And again, sometimes it's more for the family member, the this little girl's mom was getting her chemo treatment and he was keeping her entertained. And I like this quote we had from one of our patients on the bone marrow transplant unit, which is where our our whole program started, even though we're kind of a large program now at Shands. We started with just two artists on one unit and it was only had a unit with 16 beds and that was the bone marrow transplant unit. Suzanne said, music has charms to soothe the savage disease. So we do a concert on the bone marrow transplant unit out in the hall because those patients are immune compromised and they can't leave the hall. They can't leave to go downstairs to our concert in the lobby. And one of the girls who was a young girl who was a patient there said, well, why don't we have a concert? We can't go down there. So we started doing that, and that was 10 years ago. And you never know who your artists are going to turn out to be either. This is Wendy who is worked with human resources and employee resources uh, and is also a a well-known working musician in town. And she's been playing, volunteering with us once a month now for about 10 years. Excuse me, um, Kathy, we're probably, uh, we'll probably only have a few minutes left if we want to have a question and answer, um, handle all the questions in the Q&A period. So you might want to skip through some of the photos um, toward the end of your presentation. Well, this is one of our patients who came down and sat in with the band that's playing at the um, at the weekly concert. So it's really interesting. Everyone gets involved. Everyone in this band is also involved in working either at UF or the hospital. So I really like the way that it uh, everybody gets involved organically. And I like this quote from Connie Tomeno, 
who is the director of the Institute for Music and Neurological Function, who says music is a universal language but also a personal one. So sometimes when people ask, well, what's the best kind of music to play for the patient? I say, well, it's the kind of music that the patient wants to hear. And this is one of the uh, staff people. We often hand them the guitar. They look like they might need a little break in their day as well. This is a whole group of doctors, physicians, and caregivers and nurses in the University of Michigan that has the orchestra. So you, you've got a lot of talent in there in your setting that you probably don't even know about. <laughs> and this little um, study about singing enhances these various things. I like the last one. After they sang in this study, they 89% said that they experienced intense happiness. <laughs> Like this gal here. See, I'm not sure whether they were doing research or evaluation. We learned the difference. The main difference in that is whether you have to go through the IRB or not. <laughs> and the main thing we do is partnerships. Partnerships are great. They open the door for intergenerational communication. They increase visibility. We partnered with the community to have our, our artists come out and be part of the art walk and play for the art walk. We brought in kids from a local school who have a bluegrass band who heard the classical banjo player who was 90 years old, which was quite an interesting uh, interaction for them. And we brought in a Stomp. This is our partnership with the Performing Arts, where we bring people who are doing a show there to come into the hospital. And this is another one of those. This group of kids are waiting for their infusion treatment, as you can imagine. It doesn't usually look like that in that waiting room. In a partnership with the Butterfly Rainforest, we give a free tickets to the Butterfly Rainforest for cancer patients and their family members. This is one of the partners for that, Climb for Cancer Foundation, partners with us. It's a three-way partnership. And we put on fundraisers out in the community to raise awareness and raise some money. And that's Calvin, one of our success stories, the ending, the happy ending. From uh, Dialysis, we were singing a song there, the Dialysis Blues, and um, we got to the end of the song. We were both playing guitar, and we sang, Someday I'm going to lose these Dialysis Blues. And I thought that was the end, but then he said, One day I'm going to get me a kidney. And that was his affirmation because that's what he did. Now he's out in the community playing baseball, going to school, and being a normal kid. So that's it for my part. And this is a, um, some resources. If you do have further questions and you want more information, the, I've got the same link for the music therapy. And also the Mozart Effect Resource Center has all kinds of stuff. That's Don Gamble, Don Campbell, who wrote the book, The Mozart Effect. Is, uh, has this huge website with all kinds of things on it. And um, you can just keep that up and look at those if you want, or we'll have it, we'll have it on the SAW website. Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much. Um, and now we're going uh, to start the question and answer um, portion of the webinar, and we'll start with questions that um, were submitted online in advance in order of, uh, of receipt. Um, and I'm actually going to uh, take everybody off of lecture-only mode. Um, so if, you, if all the participants could please put your phones on mute. Uh, now you're responsible for the noise <laughs> on your ends. Um, and uh, once, we, um, once we get through these questions, hopefully we'll have uh, time to take a couple of questions based on um, Ron and Kathy's presentation. Okay, here we go. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Okay. Um, the first question that we have uh, is, are there training and volunteer opportunities for college students interested in music as a healing to tool? If so, what must they do to qualify? Okay, um, I'll start with that one, and Kathy, feel free to jump in at any time. First of all, I wanted to point out that um, Oliver Sacks wrote the book Music Ophelia. That was the most recent book. And um, Daniel Levitin actually wrote your brain, This is Your Brain on Music. Um, but so back to the volunteer and, and internship question. Okay, here at the Music Settlement, for example, we have many college students um, who might 
volunteer with us, and we call them peer models so that they can work with individuals or small groups and be role models in terms of things such as social communication skills. And um, then there are specific internships and practicum uh, experiences when somebody is a music therapy major, and then those would be set up through their university program with various area agencies. Okay, Kathy, do you have anything you want to add to that well, one? Yeah, and there's just a lot of uh, certification programs that are sort of um, out and about, like the harp therapy group and um, healing and transition, but those aren't really as academic, and if you want to go the intensive at Chans is coming up actually in about two weeks. In July, we have the summer intensive, which is a three-week immersion program where people come from all over. We have people usually from other countries and people from all over this country. And they've started a similar one that was based on ours that's in Buffalo. For those of you who are parts farther north, that one is going to be taking place um, later on this summer as well. And there are also programs at a couple places um, in the um, east as well. Um, at Temple University, they have something called the Arts and Quality of Life Research Center. And for, for musicians and visual artists, you can go for intensive training, and then there are internships after that. And there is a place called the Creative Center in New York City, and they have a national training program for hospital artists and residents. So those aren't really volunteer, but those are other educational opportunities. Opportunities. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is um, that list question mm -hmm. for ways to um, use music in hospital settings. And I think in the interest of time, uh, we'll just compile that into a document and post it on the um, under the webinar supplemental materials. Um, do either of you do either of you have any? Um, does that sound good to you? Yeah, that's, that's fine. You can okay, use what yeah, because this attend. is kind of a lengthy answer. Right, because there really are more than five, even though the person asked for five. We came up with at least seven. <laughs> okay, great. All right, so the next question is, what are important things to review with student musicians, undergraduate and graduate, before taking them into a public space in a hospital to perform? <coughs> Kathy, you want to go ahead? Well, we have... Um, we kind of have a screening program. People come on and have to sort of screen them and see if they're, the music they're playing is going to be acceptable, whether it'll be um, not too loud and it'll be, you know, it'll have a beginning, a middle, and an end, <laughs> and it'll be nice pieces that are kind of... We, we try not to have people come... Some people come with a strong religious agenda and they want to really do a lot of, you know, um, very specifically religious music. and. We can, it's okay to include some of that, but not to do an entire program of that because, you know, not, not everyone is really going to respond positively to that, that. So we just kind of talk to them about what it's a it's a varied clientele. And we also have to sort of remind people sometimes if they're students or music, kid, you know, people from the College of Music that are coming over, is that it's not really a rehearsal space, that it's not a place where you can stop and start over and keep you know, going over the same phrase that you need practice on. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's there's a lot of different levels of involvement. And we also talked about that in the list we compiled, that one of the easiest things to do is to bring people in to do a performance series kind of as a beginning of your program. But even when you're bringing them in, it's, if, you know, you want to have the right quality of music and you want to have the right kind of music and you want to have the right volume level and make sure that the setting it's in, you've got the right instruments that are going to work there. Yeah, like That's for example, you, about the piano. Yeah, you might not want to have brass instruments necessarily because right. they, they really do carry. They're okay um, for special events. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then um, I, what I'm about to say, some people might think is overly simplistic, but there is a stereotype that minor music is more equated with sad and major is more equated with happy. And I'm not saying that that's my opinion. I'm just stating that it's commonly occurring. And we did have an instance in um, 
a palliative medicine unit at one of the hospitals where we uh, have performances as well as music therapy, and the doctors told one of the therapists that they didn't want her to have any minor music performed because it would be too depressing for the patients. Now, sometimes patients will request that. So, mm-hmm. That's and then, one of those subjective things that you just right. have to sort of go with when it comes up. And then the final thing, well, I want to say two final things about this question. One of them is that you might want to review some boundary issues uh, for this um, the musicians in that they themselves would be discouraged to divulge their own personal information or you could... Uh, coach them with what might be safe kinds of questions to ask, like if they're taking requests. But but um, if some patient has an interesting reaction that they really can't um, handle, then they being the student, then, you know, when is it the appropriate time to refer a patient to a music therapist? And then also you might want to prepare the students for what they might see, you know, people coming with IVs, people coming with, you know, no hair, all the different kind of uh, visual experiences they might have in a hospital. Okay, thank you. Um, The next question is, can you discuss how to understand the hospital as a cooperation and what things musicians need to be aware of or wary of when entering a business model we aren't familiar with? I thought that word might have meant, they might have meant to say corporation. Yeah, I wondered about that also. It it was an interesting mistake if it was because you do need cooperation in the corporation. Yeah. <laughs> Freudian slip. Right. That's kind of like the previous question, really. It, it depends on what where you are, what hospital you're. You know, you're going to have to follow the parameters and the rules and regulations of of um, the place where you are, and they're all slightly different. Everyone's got their own set of rules and regulations and safety and hygiene and HIPAA, the privacy that's everywhere, the HIPAA rules about privacy and confidentiality. And that's one reason why you can't really get into those conversations like Rana was talking about, even if they may want to. But I think you just have to get, you know, when people first come in, they have to be kind of monitored and made aware of all those rules. Right, and I think you know, I think we need to make them aware that there's a lot of political agendas that could be going on in large hospitals, and so just because they want something to happen doesn't mean they can't, you know, that they shouldn't be going through the appropriate channels. And I think it's really good for any interested parties to kind of, um, if you were supervising one of these people, perhaps you could give them an organizational chart of the hospital so they see how it operates, either from the top down or the bottom up, and yeah, encourage. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, Thanks, and encourage collaboration with other professionals so that the musicians or music therapists, whichever, you know, profession we're talking about, become accepted and desired on the various teams. Mm -hmm. And I know that my music therapists, um, they try to become involved on some hospital committees so that, again, they're really, you know, to use the medical word, infusing themselves into the whole hospital. And and we could offer in-service training to various departments, and get to know the people in institutional advancement and development because they might be really helpful to get funding for your programs and also yeah. to try to hook up if if a hospital has um, a community outreach program. The in-services are great and to let people know what you're going to be doing, right. what it is you'd like to do, and get their input on where they'd like to have you do it to start. And then those relationships are kind of like partnerships that are internal. You really wind up partnering a lot with internal like facilities and development and public relations, all those community relations, those are all going to be in hospital departments that are going to be involved in what you do. Okay. Okay, great. And um, I think at this point, um, those are the questions that were submitted well in advance. So at this point, I'd like to um, reserve just a couple of minutes for any questions that um, that came up um, from any of the participants uh, based on uh, Rana and Kathy's presentation. So if anybody has a question, uh, please identify yourself and state your, your question. No? Hi, can you hear me? Oh. <laughs> Hello. Hi, this is Sharina Casey. I'm with uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I do music coordination, and, and basically what that is, we serve the six months to five years of age uh, patient population. 
these kids are visiting in our primary care centers, which are uh, strategically placed in low-income parts of Columbus. And what I do, I staff music volunteers in these waiting areas. So, and these volunteers will range from, you know, music teachers, retired music teachers, music majors in school, music therapists, and they uh, carry forth with them a monthly-based curriculum, and it's actually a pediatric literacy program, so we're intertwining literacy and music together. Um, do you have any suggestions? I just have two quick questions. Um, any suggestions, one, for since we serve such a diverse patient population, we have a very large Somali and Hispanic population, when it comes to singing, in terms of singing, um, considering that none of my music volunteers are able to, um, are not bilingual, and either Somalian or, or uh, speaking Spanish, how would you carry forth kind of the singing component of um, interacting with those patients? You can learn. There's a lot of books that have ethnic songs that can be learned, even if people don't speak the language. Mm -hmm. um, we use the Rise Up singing book. This is kind of like our Bible. It's <laughs> got about a thousand songs in it, I think twelve hundred songs in there. It's not the music, it's just the lyrics. Sure. Okay. And chords, little chord chart. Mm -hmm. But um there's quite a few songs in other languages in that book. Right. And uh, Right, and I, I would um agree with Kathy and also say that, you know, your public library is your friend. Um when I started putting together this lullaby um group, as I mentioned, with the moms with depression, and also we do this with teen moms. I went to the public library and took out a ton of CDs of lullabies, and I was particularly looking for ones that were multi, you know, like very diverse and multilingual or, you know, multicultural. That was the word I was looking for. And then also there's good books, you know, good music books, such as the one that Kathy mentioned, plus there's a whole bunch of them by a man named John Feierabend, F-E-I-E-R-A, B as in boy, E-N-D, and he has a lullaby book, and um, there's just many, many resources for music in other cultures, and I would definitely, even if the musician doesn't know how to speak that language, I mm -hmm. think it really means a lot to a person to hear a song from his or her culture. And right. if you, I just want to say one other thing about that. If you are trying to find some simple things you want to say and you need them translated into different languages, I was made aware several months ago of, of a website called Babelfish, as in the Tower of Babel. <laughs> and so okay. it's B-A-B-E-L-F-I-S-H. And so you can go on there and, you know, put something that you wrote and get a translation, or conversely, get a translation from Spanish or whatever into English. Oh, so, how cool. Oh, yeah. thank you and so much. There's yeah, a lot of Internet resources to do things like that. Yeah, they have the music. We incorporate a lot of music instruments from all across the world, mm -hmm. and most of these are, just for epidemiology purposes, are percussion-based, you know, so they might be, you know, gourd maracas from Peru to like the Japanese Den Den. So they're getting to know cultures through the music instrumentation side. But I just wanted to kind of branch out into when they're actually singing with the kids as well. So mm -hmm. that's perfect. And can I, do I have time to ask one more? I'm sorry. One more question? Sure. Thank you. Um, I think it was you, Rana, earlier. We're actually expanding into the NICU. And um, we are constantly just looking for research. Um, so do you guys have any just information on where I could look to find just research to back up music within the NICU unit? Um, oh, there, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's fine. Yeah. Oh, I, what was the rest of your sentence? <laughs> oh, no, that's basically it. Uh, there is quite a lot of research um, in the NICU in music therapy and using recorded music. It's not all doing music, live music. Um, Jane Stanley, S-T-A-N-D-L-E-Y, um, is very prolific in that area, um, and there's a number of books. Actually, if you go on the AMTA website, there is a book by her that you could purchase, and it's about music therapy in the neonatal intensive care unit. I can't remember the exact title of it, but so. And then, then you can get a lot of references from that. If you could only do one thing, that might be your quickest thing. And her is Standley S T A N D L E Y. Yes. Right. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, 
maybe we'll take one more quick question if anybody has a quick one. I ha are you able to hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Alice Kinsler in Concord, New Hampshire. And when Kathy was talking about that feeling of intense happiness that when people sing with other people, um, I wonder if you, Kathy, or anybody else has experienced having um, singers who visit people at the bedside and encourage pa uh, patients to sing in the acute setting, to sing with people. Oh, sure, we do that. I mean, usually, you know, it's kind of a process. You go in and I say, would you like to hear a song? And then I'll mm -hmm. start singing a song. And they'll just sometimes they'll just start singing right then. Mm -hmm. Or other times they'll say, would you like to sing with me mm -hmm. after after we get through the first part? You know, would you like some music today? What would you like to hear? Would you like to play? Would you like to sing? You kind of get it. Um, and then a lot of times everyone everyone in the room starts singing, and sometimes I've been in there where the curtain between the two rooms is closed, but I could hear that the curtain between the two beds. Two beds, yeah. Right. And uh, I could hear the people next next door singing, too, and I'd say, well, do you mind if I open this curtain? And then you open the curtain, and, and it turns out that, that they're all, you know, they're all church-going, and they like to sing the same songs, but you know, one family's black, one family's white. They didn't even really necessarily meet up that much. But when I leave, they're still singing. Mm. Right. Um, but it does, it really does bring people together. And that's one of my favorite things to do, really, is the power of song, I think, is just one of the most yes. valuable things. Do you provide lyrics, books of lyrics, or laminated sheets or anything like that? Well, you can do that. We can have a, you know, we have several little notebooks that do have lyrics, especially like working with the older people in mm -hmm. the, Alzheimer's or the dementia areas where we go, those um, those are songs mainly from the 20s, 30s, 40s. But uh, the Rise Up Singing book, that's got songs from all different eras, and sometimes we just use that and hand it to people. Like when we do the concert out in the hall in the bone marrow unit, mm -hmm. I'll hand a couple of those Rise Up Singing books to people and say, do you see anything in here you'd like to do? And that gives Great. people a chance to think of something because people aren't, Especially yes. in that setting, they're not necessarily going to be thinking about, well, what music do I like? Or what right. Do I like mm -hmm. to sing? They might not be able to pull it out of the air. And mm -hmm. um, right. in music therapy sessions as well, it really depends on the patient and and how ill they are. You know, sometimes right. you might have somebody who's, who's doing passive participation, but other times you're going to have people who are doing very active participation, such as singing or playing instruments. So, but, but there's a very wide range of interventions and musical experiences that both uh, bedside musicians and music therapists can provide and offer. Yes, um, this is Karen Heinley from Lancaster, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, I just want to uh, add on to that last question. Uh, when you are singing or playing a musical instrument at the bedside, how do you control um, not interfering with a, another patient that's in the room that perhaps doesn't want to be involved in it? Um, or when you have music on the hall, how do you, you know, uh, other than closing doors, how do you respect the privacy and maybe the wishes of, of individual patients that don't want to participate in a music program? How do you handle that? I just always check in with the other patient. I mean, if, if they're sleeping over there, then I'm just quiet. I only do something quietly with the curtain closed. Or, or, um, or if or I ask if, if they mind if they would like to hear some music too, or would they mind if we do some music? Um, as far as going out in the and then that way, like that situation I mentioned, a lot of times they'll go, wind up getting involved too, and it kind of creates a relationship sometimes between those two patients that wasn't there before. But the other thing is in the hall, we're just walking through through the hall and playing, so it goes by pretty, pretty quickly. And people are, if they don't want, you know, if they have their door closed, they're not going to hear it. And if we stop somewhere in a doorway because someone wants to hear what you do, and then you're usually going to move inside that room. So it's not really too much of a problem. Do you Although ever play at, like, the end of a hallway? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. I did go down the hall one time with a banjo player, and the banjo's kind of loud. And banjo is one of those instruments people either love or hate. But it was amazing. It literally really brought people up in their beds and looking out in the hall and going, is that a banjo? You know, but it's it just goes by kind of quickly. Right. Well, some of our floors have small rooms at the ends of the halls, 
and you know we wondered about having you know some type of performances in there that patients that could come out could go and hear the music, but maybe oh, not yeah. disturb as many of uh, patients that weren't. Did right, right. especially if it's an acute unit, yeah, and that's that's in our list that we made that's going to be posted. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's kind of one of the levels of um, bringing the music in. You know, that's kind of the midway level between the lobby and the bedside. Right, yeah, because those areas. Often, yeah, there's often a day room or um, mm-hmm. the palliative medicine unit that I mentioned has a lovely solarium and it has a great view looking out over the city and um, there's doors that you can close and so we that's where actually I performed there with the music therapist and she accompanied me and um, so we're not really disturbing people because we're in the solarium and the door is closed mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so I think that that is a very good option okay well thank, thank you, you. Um, I think that's all we have time for today we're actually 10 minutes over but uh, that's great because it means that we had a really lively discussion and people were really um, you know engaged by the material so I want to thank you Rana and uh, Kathy for um, for your uh, sharing your insights today um, if anybody has any additional questions follow-up questions um, uh, that are specific uh, you can please take advantage of our um, Ask the Experts uh, service on the Society's website. And also you'll be receiving an email asking you for uh, to fill out a brief evaluation. So please take a couple minutes to do that because it helps uh, uh, that feedback helps us and the consultants uh, There's know. There's a lot of good research on the SAW website, too. They have an amazing um, research database for those of you who are asking about research. Mm-hmm. And if any of you want further questions um, from me, my email is kathy at songsofflorida.com. That's kathy with a C. And we can um, run as we, right. we can put that on the sheet. Um, okay, why don't you go ahead and put the, both yeah. of ours on the sheet then? Yeah, with okay. the um, with the list of questions. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I have thank a you. I have a quick final question. Just, I joined you all late. Um, could you tell us again how we would have access to the materials that were presented today? It's on the Society's website uh, in the webinar archive. So if you just go to the webinar page, um, at the bottom you'll see a link that says Past Webinar Sessions, and there you'll find the information um, with the PowerPoint slides and everything. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank we'll you, everyone. Thank you. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.